Today, we're going to get to your number three uh, top ask question, which is how do I handle difficult people? Come on, I'm so glad I'm not alone. You know what I mean? No. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, tell them you're not alone. Come on, tell them you're not alone. They're everywhere. They are. They're the difficult people, they're everywhere, I promise you. And look, the Bible is not silent on this topic. It has a lot to say about how do we handle difficult people in our lives. So let me start off. I'm going to jump in. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We got a lot to cover today. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, a servant of the Lord. How many servants of the Lord in here? Yeah, yeah. All right, then this is for you. Look, look. a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. That's like must not. Like you shouldn't be quarreling, getting in fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but they're difficult. I know, I'm going to help you, I promise. Must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and look at this, be patient with difficult people. I'm just glad it's in the Bible. Like God, know, God knows. He recognizes what he put us on this earth with. Thank you, God, for at least recognizing that we got difficult people. So what, what I want to do is help you with some steps, really, some steps on what to do with the difficult people in your life. But before we do, before I give you the steps, I want to kind of identify six like categories of types of difficult people in our life, okay? I'd like to do that first, identify the six. I could have gave you probably a hundred different types of difficult people, but uh, let me just boil it down to six maybe main categories that are in our life. These are the difficult people that are in your life. They're in our life. They're in our families. They're in our, they're our neighbors. They're in your jobs. They're, they're in your communities. They're at, at the soccer club. They're in, in the churches. They're everywhere. Difficult people are everywhere. All right, here's six categories. Write them down with me. Take some notes. Number one is what I call demanding. The demanding people, they're the little dictators of life. They're just constantly like bossy and pushy and controlling and intimidating, and they dominate every conversation, and they make unrealistic expectations on your time and on your schedule, and they just push, 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 push. <laughs> the demanding people. Okay, here's, here's the second kind is what I call the disapproving. The disapproving people. These are the nitpickers. They're picky, picky, picky. Highly critical, constantly negative. Nothing you do is ever good enough. They're judgmental. They could be perfectionists. Um, they love pointing out your mistakes. Yeah, they, the disapproving people. Here's a third category. Some of you I know are seeing yourself in it, but and some of you are seeing your neighbors. You need to stop elbowing people and stuff. And <laughs> this is just self-examination time, you guys. Don't be like, Come on, let God speak to you here. The third kind of difficult person is what I call the deafening people. They're just loud, okay? You got loud mouths, people that like, they like to talk a lot. This is the person that when they're ringing, they're calling, you, ask, you actually question yourself, do I pick up this phone because 30 minutes of my life are going to go away? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm sacrificing my life and time. Is, is, it's going to, and these are the people that will... They will talk you into the ground. You end up just going, okay, I give up. Fine, fine, you win, I give up. Because they just talked you into the ground. These, they just love to argue, the deafening people. Here's the fourth category, and that is the destructive people. Destructive people. These people are like volcanoes, I like to call them. They just erupt. They're just volatile, uncontrolled, angry. It's not easy maybe to spot them when they're not, but you don't know when they're going to blow like a volcano, man. And then they just, they just erupt and blow up and explode and leaves everything scorching and lava burning, okay? And if you live with a volcano type person, then, then you know, you walk on eggshells a lot. You just, because you don't want to, you don't want to set them off. A family can live in fear for this type of attitude. On, they don't know when's the next outburst going to happen and there's a lot of tension and burn casualties are high with the volcano people, the destructive people. Here's the fifth category, and that is, I call these people the discontented. These are the people that get their feelings hurt very, very, very easily. They're the crybabies. They're the whiners. They're the, come on, everybody got some crybabies in their life. They just, they just whine and whine, and they get, like, they, they're chronic complainers. They got a martyr complex. They, they, they get attention by whining, and they end up getting all nasally. They have this nasally sound to them almost, this, the, the discontent. They're just never happy. They're just they're, they're difficult people in our life that are just never happy. Okay, here's that sixth 
category, the sixth kind of people, are what I call the demeaning. The demeaning. These are just the smart mouse. The, 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 they're rude. They're insulting. Maybe they cuss. They talk you down. They beat you down with their words. They're bubble busters. They like to just bust your bubble, man. They like to just deflate you. They're disrespectful, petty, mean. They're mean people. And by the way, people who are rude all the time, they're rude because they have enormous insecurities. The more rude and mean someone is, the more insecure they actually are. So what I want to do today is I want to take you through a summary of verses of what the Bible says about how to deal with difficult people in your life. And I'm going to give you six steps, six steps. And I've discovered in my own life, each step, it gets a little bit harder every time. Okay. So the first step I'm going to give you, it's a hard thing. It's hard. But the second one's harder. And the third one's even harder. And the fourth one's even harder. Okay, because, because this is, I'm going to give you what, and you ask for it, okay? You ask, what does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? It's not easy, but if you do it his way, I'm telling you, it's better. It, it's, just, it's just better you do it his way. This is the way you counter, you counteract the difficult people in your life according to the Bible. Okay, you ask for it, so here it is. How do I deal with difficult people, Pastor? Write this down. Take some notes. The first thing you need to do is this. You need to refuse to be offended. Just refuse. What I mean by that is don't take it personally. No matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter how they look at you, no matter what insult it is, like what you need to realize is when somebody is mean or insulting or rude, they're not revealing anything that's inside of you. They're revealing what's inside of them. Okay? That's what you need to understand. You need to understand like they're not exposing anything. The problem isn't with you. The problem's not yours. They are. They're difficult They're a difficult person, okay? So we just got to refuse. Off the bat, don't get offended because it's not about you. It's about them. See, when they're smart and off and they're rude and mean, it reveals what's in their heart, not, not what's in your heart. So don't get offended. Really, in your life, there's a lot you could get offended at. There's, there's, there's a lot of people and things you could be offended by. And I actually think you should get offended at some things. You know, I, I think you should take offense to some things. I think you should, you should I get offended by, by racism. Racism offends me, okay? Um, injustice offends me. Babies who are killed before they have a chance to live offends me. The, the sex exploitation and sex trafficking in our culture offends me. Babies who are kids or people even who go to bed hungry offends me. There are some things that should offend you in life, but check it out. Please listen. God says, when it comes to your personal relationships, get over it. Get over it. You're you're not to take offense for your personal relationships. You just, you can't. You got to resolve not to be offended. You got to learn that emotional and spiritual maturity is largely determined by how you treat those who mistreat you. Come on, I, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. Your, your, your emotional and spiritual maturity largely depends on how you respond, how you react to those who mistreat you, how you respond to those who misunderstand you. That shows your spiritual and emotional maturity. So do I, do I tit for tat? Do I get even? Do I, when they insult me, do I insult back? When they get angry at me, do I get, do I get angry back? If so, I'm no better than they are. Emotional and spiritual maturity is determined by my reaction to people who try to hurt me. The demeaning, the demanding, the discontented, the disapproving, all these types of people. The destructive. So how do you handle those kinds of people? Proverbs 12, 16. says, when I was a fool, or when, when a fool is annoyed, he quickly lets it be known. Wise people, though, will ignore the insult. See, you are, if you're wise, you'll ignore it. If you respond an insult with an insult, you're a fool. I'm not trying to get up in your face or anything like that. I'm just trying to tell you what the Word of God says. When you respond that way, foolish people give back what they got. Wise people learn how to ignore the insult. How do you do this, Jason? Let me give you, let me give you some tips on how to do this. you got to learn how to look past their behavior to the pain. You see, everything we do, everything we say, is, is, it's an emotional reaction to something. 
You got to look past that, that behavior to the pain that they're experiencing. And the, re- the reason why you get so irritated by people, and you have even people, you're, you're thinking about them right now, the people that frustrate you and the difficult people in your life. The reason why they frustrate you so much and they irritate you so much is because you don't know their personal background. You don't know their story, so you cut them no slack. Let's be honest. I mean, you, you do cut people some slack. You, you let people off the hook a lot probably in your life. And who are they? They're the people you know. You know their background. You know their story. So you give them grace. But the people who irritate like that coworker who irritates you, that boss that irritates you, maybe that neighbor or the person on your kid's soccer team or whatever it is that irritates you so much, the reason why they irritate you is because you don't know their story. You don't know if he was molested when he was a kid. You don't know if she was orphaned. You don't know if, if, if they're on their third marriage and her husband walked out on her three times already with the bill. You don't know this, so you give no grace and you cut no slack for that person. Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs 19, 11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Man, you don't get offended. Why? Because wisdom gives you patience. See, what I'm talking about here is real love. This is, this is real love. In fact, the Bible says refusing to be offended by others by other people is actually an act of mature love. It shows how much love you have in your heart. See, the more love you have in your heart, the less offended you will be by difficult people in your life. The less love that you have in your heart, the easier it is to take offense at the difficult people in your life. Proverbs 10, let me show it to you. Proverbs 10, 12. Love is what enables us. Love overlooks the wrongs that others do. See, the more I'm filled with love, the less I'm going to be upset with you when you're demanding or demeaning or disrespectful or discontented or whatever the case may be. So that's the first step. I need to choose to refuse to be offended. I'm not going to take it personal anymore. I refuse to be offended by difficult people. Here's the second thing, and it gets harder. Here's step two. You don't wait for an apology to forgive them. You don't wait for an apology to forgive them. See, I think a lot of us here, we have had people in our life that have been difficult, challenging, frustrating, maybe hurtful, painful. And, 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 and a lot of you know what the Bible says. So you know you're supposed to forgive. You know, like, I'm supposed to forgive. I got to forgive them. I know that. I'll forgive them when they repent, right? When they, when they, when they figure it out, when they understand when they, when, they, when they finally figure it out, and they, when they ask me or when they, that's when I'll, and so you hold on to this bitterness and resentment and they've long forgotten about it, okay? They've, they've already moved, moved on here because here's the, the truth is, you guys, the fact is they may never come and ask for forgiveness. They may never come to you and ask for forgiveness. Why? Because they're difficult. That's why. They're a difficult person. The light bulb never may come on for them. And you're held hostage to this by, by resentment. Never hold on to a hurt because resentment tears you up. So what do you do? You say, even before, even before they take another step, they can do anything. I don't care if they do it again. They don't do it again, whether they're sorry or they're not. I'm just deciding, even here, right now, today, this morning, I'm deciding to forgive them. I don't, they don't need to do anything else. I don't need to wait for an apology. I'm choosing to forgive that person. Jesus said this in even the most extreme circumstance. Jesus modeled this for us. On the cross, he's hanging there. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And isn't that the, look, everyone, every difficult person in your life doesn't really know what they're doing. They don't. They don't know really what is happening spiritually or emotionally. They don't really know the effect of their, of their, of their anger or their actions or their words or their attitudes. They really don't know what they're doing. They haven't been awakened by the gospel of Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. They, ha- they don't know what they're doing. Really, they don't. I mean, even the ones that are doing it intentional, they really don't know what they're doing. They're just responding to an inner hurt. They're responding to their own hidden pain, and they're hurting all these people around. So what do you do when you have a hard time forgiving a difficult person? When I have a hard time forgiving a difficult person, I like to remember scriptures like this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. 
you must make allowance. That word there, make allowance in the Greek, means to bear with, to endure, to be tolerant. Basically, what he's saying is you need to cut people some slack. You need to cut people. You must cut people some slack for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Because remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. You want, you want some slack in your life? You need to learn how to cut people some slack. Jesus said, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. I don't know about you, but I need some mercy in my life. I need more grace and more mercy. Jesus says, man, you want the blessing of God? You want more mercy? Then you need to be merciful to others. So you don't wait for an apology to forgive them. All right, let's take another step. Let's go even further. What do we do now? Number three, refuse to gossip about them. I refuse to gossip. And this is a tough one with difficult people. Let's be honest. This is a tough one with difficult people because when that difficult person does, they, they did it again, man. They, you were at work and they said some crazy thing. They did something just, man, what do you want to do the first thing when you get in your car? You call your friend like, can, I, I take, can you believe what she said? And I, my goodness. And, and in fact, when they're right, they're doing it. They're being ugly and crazy and mean or difficult or demanding. You're texting your friend right there. You know, like, oh my God, look at, she said, and you're snapping it right now. Like, oh my God. <laughs> it's so easy to gossip about people. You know why? Because we do that because we want affirmation from other people. We want affirmation. Someone is being mean or rude or disrespectful, so I want affirmation from somebody else, and it feels good. Let's be honest. Gossiping about people feels good because I can get affirmation about how I feel about other people. It may feel good, but please listen. It's unloving, and it's unbiblical, and it's destructive to your life. Look what the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 9. Disregarding other people's faults preserves love. That'll keep love in your life. That'll keep that fire strong in your life. But gossiping about them separates close friends. So what, what is gossip? One person described gossip, defined gossip as talking about or sharing information with somebody who is not part of the solution or part of the problem. So they, they weren't a part of it at all, but you brought them in so you could feel better about yourself. And gossip in, it, in itself, gossip is a form of retaliation. You're getting back at that person without even talking to that person. You're just talking about them behind their back. So you're retaliating. And it's incredibly, gossip is incredibly destructive. Gossip is destructive to your family. It's destructive to your friendships. Gossip is destructive to your business. It's destructive to churches. Gossip is destructive to your life. It separates close friends. And the worst thing about gossip is when you start gossiping about that difficult person, they win. They win. They're now controlling your conversation. They're now controlling your emotions. Your whole day becomes about talking about that difficult person. Instead of feeling you could be talking about something great in your life. You could be talking about something good that God is doing or could do in your life, but you're caught up gossiping about a difficult person, giving them control of your life. 1 Peter chapter 3, 9 says, Do not do wrong to repay a wrong. Do not insult to repay an insult. But repay, look at this, with a blessing. Because you yourselves were called to do this so that you might receive a blessing. See, you, when you, got, when you, you can gossip about someone and you'll miss out on the blessing of God. You'll miss out on his blessing. But instead, if you choose not to, look what happens. He says, by choosing not to gossip, not only do you get your conversations right in the right direction, in a positive direction in your life, but you receive God's blessing in your life. I refuse to gossip about them. Here's step number four. I'm getting a little bit harder now. I refuse to play their game. You got to refuse to play their games. And, and what's the game? Difficult people love to argue. Difficult people love to debate. They love to suck you in. Because why? Because they want to get your attention. And if you fall for this trap, and we've all fallen for this trap, man, getting sucked into that argument, that fight that goes nowhere. Because we think, this is what happens. We, end up, we think, if I could just logically explain, if I could just reason with this person why their life is 
trailing, like the spiraling out of control. It's actually bad for them. It's actually hurting their own life. And if I could just get them logically, if I could just reason with them, then they would go, wow, Jason, thank you so much. My whole life I've been a demanding jerk, but thank you for, rec- for revealing that to me. Does that ever happen? Seriously? No, it never happens. In fact, when you try to reason with a difficult person, what happens? They hate you all the more, don't you? They get mad at you all the more for bringing logic and reason into it. No, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because difficult people didn't come to their position through reason, so you can't reason them out of it. It doesn't work. You can't talk people out of a behavior they didn't talk themselves into. They got, a, they got, that, got into that behavior because of an emotion, not because of logic, Okay? So don't play their game. There's a lot of examples on how to not do this, how to not play that game in the Bible. The master example himself is Jesus, though. Jesus was the master at this. He didn't play games with people. And there were a lot of difficult people in Jesus' life. They were called Pharisees. The the, the Pharisees, they were the religious authorities of those days. And they hated Jesus. They wanted to, you know, they were trying to trap him. They were trying to always get him to say the wrong thing. They're always trying to get him to, to take the wrong steps so they could just pounce him. So they're always questioning and probing and pushing and pushing and pushing. But Jesus simply wouldn't play their game. Let me give you an example in Matthew 22. It says, The Pharisees plotted a way to trap Jesus into saying something damaging. But Jesus knew they were up to no good. He said, Why are you playing these games with me? I'm not going to play that. I'm not going to go there with you guys. Why are you trying to trap me, Jesus wouldn't fall for it. He wouldn't get pulled into an argument and a debate that he knew would go nowhere. It's not going to end anywhere. Another example, example is Paul. Paul is just like Jesus. Paul, Paul, would, Paul refused to get into word games with people and to get into these little manipulative games that people like to play. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, Paul says, We reject all shameful and underhanded methods. See, I, Paul, I'm not going to play that game. I mean, you, you, you can play that way. You can be difficult that way. You can try to work behind the scenes and in the dark and get people to agree with your side of the story or think the way you think. And, and I'm not going to play that way, though. I'm not going to be underhanded at all. I'm not going to play the game. We don't try to chick any, trick anyone. And we don't distort the word of God. Look at this. We tell the truth before God. That's it. I just, I just tell the truth. My life is in the light of God's word. I'm in the, I got nothing to hide here. I am going to tell, I'm not going to, you can, okay, you can lie and manipulate all you want. You can play those games and use those underhanded methods all you want, but I am going to tell the truth before God and check this out. And all who are honest, they know it. They know who's manipulative and deceptive and trying to get people on their side and they know who's standing in the light. I'm going to stand in the light of God's word and all who are honest know it refuse to play that game. You may be trying to be uh, difficult, but I'm not going to do it. And you know what? You know what? The difficult people in your life, they know, they, they, they want to hook you into this game. They just want, they, they throw out bait and they try to bait you into this argument or into this like this, because that's how they get their attention and their affirmation. And they find their value by just messing with you. Okay. And this is even harder now with social media. It's because you see something posted about something. It just, oh, it frustrates you so much. Like, and you just, you just want to, you just want to like rattle off something real quick. Let me just put that. Let me just share my thought. Let me just share my, and right when you do, listen, please, right when you do, that difficult person on the other end goes, oh, I caught a big one. Yeah. They hooked you with it. That's what they wanted. You're playing their game. You need to refuse. You want to learn how to deal with difficult people. You ask for it. Refuse to play the game. Look at Proverbs 26, 21 says this. Just as charcoal and wood keep a fire going, a quarrelsome person keeps an argument going. That person likes to keep the argument going. He wants you to engage. He wants to keep it. She wants to keep it going. They find their purpose and their attention in getting you upset. How many people does it take to argue though? Two, right? Last service, someone said one. Uh, if, 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 you're, if your thought to that was one, then you are the difficult person, okay? Okay. 
It takes two people to argue normally. Um, but check it out. What happens? What happens if one goes away? The fire goes out. See, what happens if one decides, I'm not going to play that game? The fire goes out. You refuse to play the game. Okay, here's the fifth step in dealing with difficult people. You have to just refuse to cave in. Refuse to cave in. Don't give in to their demands, to what they want. That difficult person who's demanding or demeaning or derogatory, deafening, discontented, whatever they're talking about here, the difficult people in your life, you refuse to cave in. You don't allow them to manipulate your life. See, love is not allowing people to manipulate you. That's unloving to you. That's unloving to God, and that's unloving to them. See, a lot of Christians don't understand this, okay, because I need to camp out here for a moment, because some Christians actually think that the way the Christian, oh, the Christian response is, I just, I just, you know, let you get your way then. I'll just passively acquiesce. Go ahead and I'll be a doormat. You know what? I looked throughout the whole scriptures. There is no place where the Bible says you got to be someone's doormat. There is, there isn't. You don't need, don't let them manipulate you. Don't cave in. There's not one scripture that, oh, but wait a second, pastor. You just said like, I need to forgive them, that we need to be forgiven. Yes, you do. Forgiveness is immediate. Trust is earned. See, this is what a lot of people don't understand, even Christians. Forgiveness, like you have to forgive. Forgiveness is immediate, but trust is earned, okay? Like, let me give you an example. The woman who's being beaten by a, a husband who's just an angry, alcoholic man, she kicks him out of the house. He comes back later that evening. He says, honey, I'm sorry. Well, she's got to forgive him. The forgiveness has to, it doesn't matter if he said sorry or not. She has to, within her own heart, say, I'm not going to hold on to this. I, I know it's hard. I know that's hard in and of itself. But she, immediately, she has to say, God, I'm letting this go. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to hold on to that. And she has to say, yeah, I forgive you. But then he goes, well, can I, can I come back in? Can I come back in and to the house? Sorry, sucker. You know what I'm saying? Heck no. You ain't coming back in here because forgiveness is immediate. I have to forgive you. But trust is earned. You got, you got stuff to learn, bro. You, you better get on. Go, go learn. Go figure yourself out before I let you back in here because trust, trust is earned. Okay? Forgiveness is immediate but trust is earned. Now, some of you, you haven't caved in that way. Maybe you haven't caved in by letting someone walk all over you, but maybe you caved in differently. Maybe you caved in by saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Maybe you said, man, why, 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 why even try fighting? I'll just, just join. Some of, you, some of you probably said, what's the use of even trying? And you caved in. What's the use of everything so difficult? What's the, what's the use of even trying? What's the use of even being a Christian, some of you have said? What's the use of even being a part of a church and coming to church if all there is difficult people in church too? And, and there, oh, what's, the, what's the use? And so some of you caved in. You turned your back on God. You turned your back on serving. You turned your back on everything because, because of difficult people. You caved in. You lost, you lost track. You lost sight somewhere along the way. I want to share with you a very, very powerful parable that Jesus gave us in Matthew chapter 13 about this. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed. I only have a portion of it in your handout. Most of it's up here, you guys. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed a good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came in and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. That's the, that's the devil. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weed also appeared. The owner's servants came out to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in the field? Where then did the weeds come from? The enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull up those weeds? You want us to get rid of them? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you're going to uproot the wheat with them. Let both, listen, listen, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and then bundle them to be burned, and then gather the wheat to bring it into my barn. See, what happened to a lot of you who caved in like this is you were, you were in the field, one of the wheat, and you, you started looking around and going, hey, there's a bunch of weeds in this field. There's a bunch of difficult people in this field, and, and there's a whole bunch of, what's going on here? And, and you got sidetracked, and you, you left the field entirely because you, you started looking at the weeds instead of looking at Jesus. 
And, and, and what, God, what Jesus is saying is, look, it's not your job to judge. It's not your job to make judgment calls on who's wheat and who's weed. You leave that up to me. There's going to come a time where the harvester will come and will separate the weed from the wheat. But until then, you love everybody. You continue scattering seed. You make my field bigger, love everybody, and leave the result to God. Amen, somebody? Some of you, you lost... You lost track somewhere, and some of you, you, you gave up on church. You gave up on, on Jesus because of some of those wheats, because of some of those difficult people. It can happen in church. It can happen. Like, there are religious people. There are. It, again, in Jesus' day, he dealt with the same thing. Matthew chapter 15. The disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Lord, do you realize that you offended those religious people, the, the Pharisees, with what you said? Imagine that. The disciples are coming to Jesus going, hey, Jesus, I think you need to reconsider how you're saying this, this one here. I think you just, you just came off a little bit too radical, a little bit too strong, you know, and you realize you offended some of the religious people. Look what Jesus said. Every plant not planted by my father will be rooted up. But here's the key. So ignore them. Some of you need to underline that, circle it, star it, do something to that. You need to ignore the difficult people in your life. I'm going to refuse to cave in. I'm not going to get sidetracked. I'm going to run my race and stop letting you affect my race. I'm going to run my race with purpose. Amen, somebody? Ignore them. Ignore them. And then finally, the final step you need to know, and this is the most difficult that there is. When it comes to difficult people, always take the high ground. Always take the high ground whether they do it or not. If they insult you, you treat them with kindness. If they're unloving, you be loving to them. If they're resentful to you, you be forgiving to them. If they're mean to you, you're kind to them. You always take the high ground no matter what they do. Always, always, always take the high ground. Listen, you cannot control what other people think about you. You can't control what other people uh, say about you. You can't control what other people do about you. You have no control over those issues, but you do have 100% control over how you respond. It's your choice. It's your choice. And there's a whole chapter in the Bible on taking the high ground with difficult people. It's Romans chapter 12. And I want to close with three different verses from Romans chapter 12 here. Romans 12, 14, he starts with this. Ask God to bless those who persecute you. Well, man, I'm not, I don't think there's anyone persecuting me or anything like that, Pastor. Okay, do me a favor. Cross out persecute and write in makes you mad. Okay? Ask God to bless those who make you angry. Yes, ask God to bless, not curse them. See, the people that irritate you, the people who are making you crazy in life, that's how God wants you to respond. This right here, this, right, this verse, this is the real definition of love. Real love isn't loving someone who's lovable. Real love isn't loving somebody that has your personality type. Real love isn't loving those who, who have the same outlook of life you have. It's easy to love people like us. Don't you find that? It's easy, man. Why? Because I'm cool. You know what I mean? I got, the, I got a good personality. I look at life with the right outcome, and it's easy to kind of gather around people and like love people who are like me. That's not real love. Real love is loving someone who doesn't have your personality, who doesn't have your outlook. Real love is loving someone who is unlovable, who is sometimes unlovely. That is what real love is. That's what real love looks like. That right there, the definition of real love. You don't play their game. You don't fight fire with fire. You're responding with love. The next verse, Romans 12, 17 through 18. It says this. If someone has done you wrong, do not repay him with a wrong. Try to do what everyone considers to be good. Do everything possible on your part to live at peace with everybody. Then the peace de resistance is verse 21 here, where he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So you don't, you, don't, you don't fight fire with fire. When you put fire on more fire, what do you get? A bigger fire, okay? 
you, you got to fight fire with, with some water. You got you to gotta, you gotta combat evil with good. So what, what, what would happen if I actually followed what the Bible says about how to deal with difficult people in my life? Because this is not what they teach in school. This isn't what society teaches. Society teaches us if they hit you, hit them back. If they're mad at you, get even. That's, that's, the, that's the mindset of our, of our culture. But what if somebody in my life who was demeaning, destructive, discontenting, demanding, disapproving, that person in my life, that I, what, ha- what would happen if I refused to be offended? And I don't wait for an apology. I just go and forgive them the moment they hurt me. And I don't, and I don't make, you know, I make an agreement right there. I'm just going to forgive them. And I refuse to gossip. I'm not going to retaliate behind their back. I just refuse to play their game, and I refuse to cave in. And no matter what they do and they do to me, I'm going to take the high ground every time. I'm going to respond in love no matter what they throw at me. What happens when you do that? You get the smile of God in your life. You, you, get, you get the favor, the blessing of God in your life. Look at Proverbs 16 and 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord... He makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Come on, wow. As your pastor who loves you, I'm telling you, I want this verse to be a reality in your life. I want your ways to so please the Lord that he makes even your enemies live at peace with you. Come on, let's bow our heads in prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you, God.